Jasper, and it's really almost the end of our program. And we surely had fun. And thank you, RKHT, for having so many quasi-particles in one place. So uh, we covered lots of topics, and it's a huge field. So what I'll do today, I will just try to give you a flavor of what we've been interested in here. And because this is a blackboard talk, I will try to solve a couple of toy models. Um, and I will aim at everyone. So my, our colleagues from my program will probably hate me for oversimplification, but I will try uh, to be as uh, explicit as are possible. So here is a short outline. Uh, I will start with a brief intro into thermoliquids and non-thermoliquids. Then I will uh, show how our quasi-particles, although fit, can be mischievous if we want to measure uh, the, our transport. Uh, and then we'll go up local. We'll look into a very popular model these days, SYK model. We'll talk about Planck unbound, Wiedemann France law, etc. And if time permits, at the end, I will show you a piece of up recreational math, how thinking about our quasi particles helps to prove some uh, theorems uh, from pure math of 19th century. Okay, so physics of correlated electron systems, which we are all here uh, interested in, is a highly contentious uh, subject. So I will start with something that everyone uh, would probably agree to. There is air in this room. And at ambient pressure, room temperature, the average distance between uh, the molecules is about 30 angstroms. That's pretty densely packed, but the size of the molecule is about two angstroms. And so there is still plenty of room, plenty of vacuum. So if we calculate the mean free pass, taking the cross section to be two angstroms squared, and the number density corresponding to 30 inverse angstroms are cubed, we'll end up with a mean free pass, which is about one micrometer. That's pretty long, so we have well-separated molecules, and they fly through long distances until they hit each other. There's also water in this room, so some of these molecules, a significant fraction of them, at least in Florida, in summertime, is water. So we can now take this R component and condense it into liquid. And if we now zoom on the structure of this liquid, what we'll see is a pretty dense system of water molecules. which will not resemble gas at all. And if I would try, being encouraged by my success uh, with describing uh, the gases by using the gas kinetic theory, if I would just try to translate what I learned from our gases to liquids, I'll fail miserably. For, for example, based on this formula for the mean free pass, I can calculate the viscosity of gas, which is the total viscosity divided by the mass density, and that's about RMS, our velocity, times mean free pass, times factor of three, and if I do this estimate for air, I will hit right on the mark, nu of T, according to this formula, scales as square root of temperature, so it's kind of slowly increasing function, but if I look at water as a liquid, and they'll say, well, maybe I can do something like this, but with mean free pass being the intermolecular separation, I will fail, because if I would measure the actual viscosity of water, it will decrease with temperature, and it will decrease with temperature exponentially. And actually, all we know about a classical liquids comes from the analogy with solids. For example, the only working formula that I know of about a classical liquids, so the Bridgman formula, for thermal conductivity comes about in a model where you uh, replace a liquid by a cubic R crystal and then you study uh, um, a heat a transfer um, between other molecules. But in the same air, there is a minuscule uh, concentration of helium-3 atoms. It's really small. It's seven parts to a trillion. But suppose that we pick this helium-3 atoms 
put them into trap and cool them down. Well, at about 3.2 R Kelvin, uh, the gas of helium-3 molecules will condense into a liquid. So this is the boiling temperature at ambient pressure. And then there is another interesting temperature, which is the Fermi temperature, or Fermi energy, which is measured in uh, temperature units. At ambient pressure, it's about 2.5 R Kelvin. And of course, here at the R condensation temperature, I have a normal bona fide first order phase R transition. I change the phase, I have gas, I have liquid. And this liquid is more or less a usual liquid. It has non-zero bulk modules, it has surface tension, it minimizes its volume. I can pour it from one uh, dewer from another. I wouldn't be probably drinking it, but it's a liquid. As I cool further through this temperature, nothing happens visibly. It's still a liquid, but now it is a thermal liquid. There is no phase transition, it's a crossover. So here I have classical helium liquid. And here I have quantum thermal liquid. And again, I wouldn't see anything really. It will be still a liquid, it will splash, it will have surface tension. But if I would now study properties of this liquid, such as viscosity and thermal conductivity, surprisingly, I'll find something which would resemble the properties of a gas, of an ideal gas. And if I zoom on this part, on some part of a helium-3 dure, what I will see would be something remarkable. I will see closely packed molecules almost as close in water. However, if I would watch the motion of molecules in water, what I will see is no action for a long time, and then one of the molecules being thermally activated is moving with great difficulty to the next position and then stops here. It's very slow. What I will see in our quantum Fermi liquid is something amazing. Uh, a quasi-particle or particle will start moving and it will go through its neighbors as if they're not there for a long distance until it hits something and then it will turn, etc., etc. So despite the fact that we're dealing with a dense liquid, the mean free passes of particles in this liquid are long. They are much longer than the interatomic air separation. How does it happen? It's power principle. Understand it by now very well. The energy distribution in a Fermi gas satisfies the Fermi function. So if I want to know how many particles do I have at a given energy, I have this mirrored Fermi function. And the states, which are partially occupied, are located near the Fermi energy in the interval of KBT. If I want two particles to interact, well, they can do it only provided that the initial state is filled and the final state is empty. Otherwise, there is no way to go. So I have to take two of those particles. I need to make sure that the energies are in the right interval of KBT near the Fermi energy. And if I would measure a cross-section for scattering of these two particles in the vacuum, then the cross-section in the Fermi liquid state will be suppressed by a statistical factor, temperature over Fermi energy squared, squared because I need to take two particles, and so the probability to find one in this energy interval uh, is T over Fermi energy. I have two, that's other product. And so the cross-section is much smaller than a cross-section in vacuum. If I would translate this into mean free pass, the mean free pass will be uh, the interatomic distance divided, multiplied by Fermi energy over temperature squared. Okay. So, in some sense, it's a story about love. We all go through life, interacting with people, we slow down, have conversations until we find the right one. 
and this right one must have the energy in the right interval. If there is no energy in the right interval, it will slow me down, right? I will have to stop and check your energy. And my mass will increase. Usually, my, my quasiparticles are going to be are heavier than the, than the original particle. Other properties will also change. Let's say the G factor will change from 2 to something G star. But because I had to go over long distances along the room to find the right one, the mean free passes are very long, the lifetime is very long, and so these aquasi particles live for a very long time. So that's essentially. Sorry? What about zero Well, at one millikelvin, something happens in helium-3, you have a superfluid, right? And normally something happens at very low temperatures. Okay, so I will translate this now into one over tau. And one over tau will scale proportionally to uh, the square of, of temperature. And of course, my first attempt of uh, describing uh, any metal which contains uh, some form of charged R Fermi liquid will consist of trying to substitute this formula for one over tau into a Drude formula for the conductivity. On the basis of what I told you, I, would, I, might, I might expect that my uh, resistivity, which is one over the conductivity, which is mass m e squared over tau, I'll put a star here, meaning that this is at the effective mass, and then I would expect that the upper resistivity scales as d squared. And of course, good luck finding this. Uh, in good metals such as copper, uh, gold, silver, you don't see d squared at all, period. You start to see it maybe in aluminum, and typical picture where we start to see some, si some, uh, some, uh, some signatures of a Fermi liquid. Let's say this is aluminum. You have a very broad range of, of temperatures where the resistivity is linear in T. It goes to about 70 Kelvin. And then there is a curvature, exaggerated, of course, where we fit T squared plus T5. T squared is a hint of the Fermi liquid nature. T5 and T are phonons. We placed our Fermi liquid in an environment of moving atoms. So foremost interaction first and our foremost is with phonons. And this is a particularly interesting regime, which I'll have to come back, because this linear interresistivity shows up, as you can probably see from other phase diagram, all over um, the, 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 the place. But fortunately, this T, we think we, un, uh, we understand. This is so-called trivial T. What happens here is that temperature, which is the measure of the energy of the electron, is much larger than the characteristic energy of a phonon. Therefore, electrons scatter at ions of a lattice, which are thermally displaced in a random way from their equilibrium positions, as, as if uh, these ions are completely frozen. So we have static thermal disorder and the amount of the disorder is proportional to temperature simply because the number of phonons in a mode for temperature larger than other frequency of this mode scales linearly this temperature. Okay. So this T we understand. This T5 is an inelastic version of this. When we go to low temperatures, we start to, uh, to, uh, to interact uh, with dynamic phonons. Once we move into, into more strongly interacting system from copper, where we see nothing, to aluminum, where we see at least some T squared, then to heavy fermions, where the mass is very large, the Fermi energy is very small, and we start to see strong effect of electron interaction. And then finally, we move to systems which are known as strange metals and bad metals. There is uh, a bit of a difference between the two. And I sketch several canonical examples of the strange metal R behavior. These are, of course, uh, the cuprates, the superconducting R cuprates. You have uh, a phase which is antiferromagnet. You have a dome of superconductivity. If I would measure temperature down, if I would measure the resistivity down this line at optimal doping, I will see that, um, that, that resistivity goes linearly with temperature until it hits uh, the critical temperature. At the same time, it's also a bad metal. If I go 
the other way if i would increase our my temperature i will see that at some point the resistivity will hit the value of the resistivity quantum which means that if i would try to understand this in terms of some kind of um of the other formula it would mean that the mean free pass became shorter than the interatomic spacing which is impossible uh you know, within the uh within the Boltzmann picture. And all over the place, we have interesting R compounds, Tronson 3, Aplutonium 2, O7. Here, we have a very low temperature phase. And if we ignore this low temperature phase, uh, we would see a quantum R critical point of unknown nature yet. We go down this temperature, we measure the upper resistivity, we see two linear R behaviors with two different slopes all the way down to one Kelvin. This is probably a record uh, of how low this strange metallic R behavior can be. This is ethyrobium rhodium silicon 2. There is a sliver of very weak antihermetic phase. But then there is a whole interval of temperatures, and we just heard a talk in our, in our program why it's not a single R quantum critical point, but maybe it's a line of R quantum critical points where you measure the resistivity and it's linear from 900 R millikelvin all the way to 10 R millikelvin. And there is one particular system which I would like to focus on because I think this system is the best understood. It's a system of a class which is known as weak uh, ferromagnets. Namely, you have a ferromagnet with relatively low accurate temperature so that by squeezing or doping, you can kill a fer our ferromagnetism. In this, our, in this particular case, you have a metal uh, called palladium, and palladium is almost a ferromagnet. It wanted to become a ferromagnet, but it never made it. However, if you add a little bit of a nickel, which is an, uh, a magnetic atom, then at 2.6% of nickel, the metal goes a ferromagnetic. If you measure the upper resistivity at this R critical R, R concentration of 2.6, the resistivity obeys T to 5 thirds law, and we'll see that this is how we, our understanding tells us it it should be. Okay, so that was my intro. Uh, any questions at this point? All right. So, now I wanted to solve a toy model, or at least show how it works with toy model, how aqua particles can be mischievous. But for that, I need to introduce several concepts. Uh, one of them, is how do we actually go from the scattering rate scaling as t squared to a t squared term in the upper resistivity. And the path here is not as straightforward. And I like the uh, spherical Arcal models. Probably that's my best model. But if I would morph my metal into a parabolic band, with dispersion k squared over 2m star, m star being up normalized, and try to calculate the resistivity within this model. If I do everything right, and I will take into account all Feynman diagrams which I have, I will end up with a trivial up result that the resistivity of the system is zero, simply because any system with parabolic spectrum is effectively Galilean invariant, and therefore the momentum of the center of mass of the entire system only knows about the external force, which in my case is charge times the electric field, regardless of the internal interaction between other particles. So what I have to do, I have to break the Galilean in invariance. And there is one sure way to do this. We are on lattice, after all. And on lattice, the wave functions are the block states. where the role of the momentum is placed by quasi-momentum. Which means that I can add to the momentum any number of the reciprocal applied vectors. In 2D, it's 2 pi over the lattice spacing times n. If I have a R collision between two electrons such that the initial state has momenta k and p, final state has momenta k prime and p prime.
in order to have a finite R contribution of electron electron interactions to, um, to the resistivity, the change in the momentum before and after has to be equal to, well, let's call this vector B, in some dimensions, at least one of reciprocal of lattice vector. This is called UMCLAP, which is, now I'm probably going to fall on my face because there are some German uh, speakers uh, in this audience. For, uh, for a long time, I thought that UMCLAP was a noun and I was spelling it with R capital U until I was told that this is actually a verb, right? Which means jumping over. Jumping over the, uh, the fence, fence in this case being the boundary of uh, the brilliant zone. But we still use UMCLAP as a noun, so we need to have UMCLAPs. What if we don't have them? Well, why wouldn't we have them? You see, one R condition on having UMCLAPs is large Fermi surface. For if all four uh, momenta uh, on the left are on the Fermi surface, the maximum change, the maximum value of the magnitude on the left-hand side is four, four, four times uh, the Fermi momentum, and it has to be larger than the reciprocal of lattice vector. So if I have a tiny Fermi surface at the center of the brilliant zone, I wouldn't be able to uh, satisfy this. Now, this is always the case in our conventional metals with good metallic density, which is roughly one electron per atom. This is not so in our semiconductors. This is not so in low density carrier systems, such as our graphene. But number two, and this is important in the context of this last ferromagnetic to paramagnetic phase transition that I mentioned, that the interaction has to be of sufficiently short range. And it's almost always not a problem as well, because of course we start with charged electrons, but we place them in a, into a metal, we have a positive upper ground of ions, they screen each other, so the Coulomb, uh, the Coulomb interaction becomes effectively on the atomic scale. However, if we bring the system to a quantum a critical point, which signals an instability towards a phase which is uniform, then, according to this theory of second order phase uh, transitions, we can think of electrons interacting with fluctuations of the incipient order parameter. In this case, for example, it can, it can be magnetization, let's say in the z direction, produced by the same R, R permeons. If this is the main source of the interaction, the correlation length of R fluctuation diverges, and this interaction becomes of very long range. Okay? Here's my message to the other to the other workshop. If the interaction becomes a very long range, then there is a problem with satisfying this R condition as well. For suppose I have a large, a comfortably large Fermi surface, similar to what we see in other cuprates. Uh, these are field parts. This is the empty part. And now I have very long range interaction coupling the final and the initial states. Well, suppose I pick uh, the initial and final states that k is almost equal to k prime. That is, these are two initial and uh, final final momenta. But then um, the difference between p and p prime in magnitude has to take uh, the value of the reciprocal lattice vector, which is the size of the square, which is only possible at a few points. And these few points are here where the Fermi surface intersects at the boundaries of, of the brilliant zone, so they're known as hotspots. And as a result, the probability of umplot scattering is going to be strongly suppressed. Yes? Thanks. Um, you kind of this, but what is the size of the Fermi surface? Number density. Okay. Filling. Yeah. As in guess. Yeah. Um, if I have electron gas with number density n, one third of this has the units of uh, the wave number, and this number is KF. Okay, thank you. All right, so now suppose that we cannot have umclaps. Well, if I cannot have umclaps, I don't have any way to render my up resistivity uh, finite at uh, um, zero temperature because particles will uh, be running away from me. 
What I can do, I can introduce impurities, which are there anyway. That will give me finite up resistivity at zero temperature, which is known as residual up resistivity. And so then the resistivity is a constant value. This is due to impurities. But this is not the end of the story. What I want to ask is if there is a temperature dependent term which comes from interesting interaction of electrons exchanging the R fluctuations of the other parameter. Namely, can I see something with an exponent alpha, and this exponent is different from the, from, uh, from the Fermi liquid 2. Hmm? And this is where aquasi particles become somewhat mischievous. So let's do a demo. Um, well, before we do a demo, sorry, um, there is a general up result which can be derived either by diagrams or from other equations of motion that if I have a scattering up process as I have above here, it will contribute to the resistivity if a quantity which is called delta V, which is the difference of the initial and final velocities, being squared and averaged over the Fermi surface and over the statistical distribution is non-zero. This delta V has a simple meaning. It's a change in at the velocity due to one arc collision, velocity up to a factor of the charge is the same as other currents, so this is the relaxation of a current in a single collision act. Let's check. By this argument, in a Galilean invariant system, there is no up relaxation. Right? Okay. In a Galilean invariant system, V is K over M. And as you see, the momentum are conservation, everything are cancels out, so we know that we shouldn't start with a parabolic spectrum. Let's start with a spectrum which is non parabolic but still isotropic. And here comes a demo. Suppose that I have a circle of Fermi surface in 2D. I fixed the initial states with momentum K and P such that they belong to the Fermi surface. The sum of these two vectors is this large vector K plus P. And now I'm asking you to find two final states, K prime and P prime, such that the sum of K prime and P prime is still equal to K plus P. And the velocity imbalance is finite, because otherwise it wouldn't contribute to other resistivity. And I'll save the chase. There are only two solutions in two dimensions. As you can see, probably, once I fixed this vector and made it long, to find two more vectors of identical magnitude adding up to the same vector is kind of hard. And it's not really hard. It's impossible unless you choose k and p to be opposite to each other. And then the final states are also opposite to each other. This is Cooper channel of scattering. In this case, I satisfy the condition that the sum is, of course, is equal to zero in the initial state and it's equal to zero in uh, the final state. But the initial state carries no occurrence. And the final state also carries up no current, so there is no current relaxation. Or I can do a swap. I can exchange initial and final states. K goes into P. P goes into K. But then again, VK prime is equal to VP, and VP prime is equal to VK. I have zero. So, though I violated Arglilian invariance, I'm not getting finite up resistivity uh, from this kind of, of, of a Fermi surface. So what would be my naive expectation in this case if I am in a Fermi liquid? I would expect that due to broken Galilean invariance, 
I would have a t squared term, but I'm not getting it. I'm getting zero. What I need to do? Well, I need to take into account states which are not at the Fermi surface, but in a layer of widths, let's say, temperature over the Fermi velocity. And then, yes? Uh, sorry, I think I why did you, why did you break, you say you break the billion inverse, but you still have a round Fermi surface? Ah, so round does not mean the same. Uh, yeah. Me, so, 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 yeah. Forever, no. no. It's isotropic. Uh -huh. Think of DOP Dirac system. The spectrum is K. I put the Fermi energy in the upper cone, right? The spectrum is still isotropic, right? The Fermi surface is uh, circular, but the spectrum is not K squared over to M. Right? K4. K4. Okay, okay. okay, K4. So any function which is function of the magnitude only. So now if I would borrow states from the vicinity of the Fermi surface, but not from other Fermi surface, well, it's kind of obvious that one of the factors of delta V will give me the width of this interval. I have two of them, and therefore I will have a, an, a, an additional suppression of the upper resistivity by a factor of T squared with the log T for F action others. So the resistivity with scale is T4. And this is where the uh, where adequate particles get mischievous. We know that their nominal scattering rate is T squared, but they don't want to uh, contribute to other resistivity. They show up only ever weekly as T4. Just a quick question. The, the delta V squared that Aaron asked value, that resistivity is proportional to that? Yes. Uh, being averaged with scattering probability and over the Fermi surface and over the, over the, over the, the, the statistical distribution. It's kind of a memory function. Now, one can play the same game in a non-Fermi liquid version. So if I have a phase diagram, which I hopelessly erased. OK, so let me tell you where I am on this phase diagram. So the real phase diagram was in 1 minus x, because we're adding up nickel to a palladium. Let me play it the other way around. So I have x. Here is my phase. Which may be a ferromagnet, it can be animatic, it doesn't really matter. We have Jörg Schmarin here who knows everything about animatics. So it can be any phase which has, uh, which is translationally invariant. So Q is equal to zero. Then we were in a Fermi liquid. Okay, what does it mean? It means that if I would calculate the self energy due to electrons exchanging the, R, the, uh, the, uh, the fluctuations of the incipient other parameter, I will, in a non-Fermi liquid uh, region of this, so there's a Fermi liquid at low temperatures where sigma double prime scales as, let's say, T squared. Here, there is a non-Fermi liquid region where it scales as into dimensions two-thirds. Okay? So the game is that we replace factors of uh, T squared by T to two-thirds, and if we do so, then in a non-Fermi liquid up regime, the a correction to resistivity would scale as eight thirds with the log. This is sub-Fermi liquid. This is larger than two, which means that other processes, for example, the excluded unclubs, will be more dominant than other scattering process. Okay, so now what's so special about the isotropic R Fermi surface? It's a circle, of course. And circle has a simple geometric property such that if I would translate the circle into plane, it will have at most two self-intersection points. That is, if I want to solve a condition that the energy of the final state, let's say k minus q, is equal to the energy of the initial state, because I want particles to be on other Fermi surface, I have only two solutions for K. These two solutions are the Cooper channel and the stop channel. But I can also deform the circle into any convex Fermi surface. You can think, for example, of a time binding model kind of Fermi surface. It is not a circle anymore, but it is still convex, meaning that it doesn't have inflection points. And still, uh, the property of two intersection points have remained the same. So the convex case happens to be identical 
to the isotropic case, I only have trivial solutions. And to get a non-trivial solutions, I have to expand over this point, And I will come up with a suppression a contribution of the conductivity. How can I break it? I need to make dimples. I need to make inflection points. Right? Topology of the Fermi surface is the same. Andre would probably disagree. But we can go from a convex contour to a conve concave R contour adiabatically. So now suppose that I have a Fermi surface with inflection points. And counting the self-intersection points is actually the same as counting the number of tangents in a given, given direction. And now, because I have this dimple, I have three touching points on one side, three touching points on this side, six, six pairs. Two out of them are still Swap and Cooper. They are trivial, but there are others. These others will uh, contribute to uh, resistivity, and we will recover the naive expectation of T squared in the Fermi liquid and in a, a uh, two-dimensional non-Fermi liquid of the pneumatic or hermetic type. This is going to be T to four thirds. Okay, so quasiparticles are there, but sometimes we need to provide them with the right geometric um, in, in environment uh, to, um, uh, to manifest themselves. All right. That was about the uh, mischievous part. Now, as you see, well, I didn't tell you this, but if I would do this exercise in three dimensions rather than in uh, two dimensions, then I will end up with five-third scaling of unresistivity, which would be in agreement with what uh, we are seeing um, experimentally. So that's probably one of the uh, few success stories in non liquid physics. In other systems, we don't have much of a success, but we have several models which in inspire us. And one of these models is SYK model. which stands for Sadidev and Ye, who invented this in the context of random Heisenberg magnets. And Alexei Kitaev introduced Meyer and fermions in 2015. I believe this is 2005. And as far as I understand, the only preference to our Kitaev's work is the talk given in this audience at RKATP. Okay. Now, it's an inspired model, meaning that I cannot provide you with a microscopic Hamiltonian, which under certain transformations will give this model. But the model takes an inspiration in a brand matrix theory. So back in the 30s, when people like Wigner and Dyson look at the specter of atomic nuclei, they saw that they're terribly complicated. So complicated that they look random. And they said, well, maybe we'll have a better chance of understanding them rather than looking at a, at a microscopic Hamiltonian, saying, telling that we're dealing with a random system. Okay? So there is an inherent complexity in our strongly collated systems, and the idea is roughly the same. Let's forget about our microscopics. Let's, in, let's introduce a randomness. And so the simplest version of SYK model, there are now many of them, but uh, the simplest version consists of n orbitals, You can, you can think about a large atom where you have orbitals from 1 to n. The electrons belonging to these orbitals interact with some amplitude i, j, k, l. There is a chemical potential to fix the feeling. And I will scale out a factor of n to three halves, just for our power counting. U is a random variable. It's a Gaussian variable with average equal to zero and non-zero RMS value equal to some R constant. Here, orbitals, it's all in all. all orbit, one orbital interacts with all other orbitals. There is no notion of the momentum here. It's a, it's, a, it's a finite size system, if you wish, a quantum dot or large atom. 
And therefore, the Green's function of the system is entirely local. Okay. There is a large end limit of this model, and as many models, it becomes exactly soluble in the large end limit, which means that the diagram for the self-energy as a function of frequency is a simple, what is known, Mellon diagram And this is the RMS value of the random R potential. Now, the Green's function in Matsubara space is an entirely local object. Let's say that mu is equal to zero, which means that uh, the system is half, half field. And in the limit when the self energy is much larger than other frequency, which means that we are on a strong R coupling limit, the energy due to the interaction of the orbitals with each other is larger than the energy uh, itself. This model allows for a simple scaling uh, solution. As you see, sigma omega here is an integral, d omega 1, d omega 2. And now I will uh, replace each of other Green's functions by 1 over the self energy. There is u squared, that's uh, the coupling constant squared. And because of this power law nature of uh, this uh, relation, if I would choose an ansatz for the self energy, some prefactor times frequency to some power alpha, if I would, cup, if I would count the powers on the left and on the right, I will end up with a simple up result that A is a square root of the, in, of the interaction energy while alpha is one half. Okay. Now, by this measure, this is a strong non-R non Fermi liquid. This is when a quasi particles go absent because at the definition of a Fermi liquid is a state where the imaginary part of the self energy of the width of the, of the quasi particle peak is smaller than the energy itself. Here, it is larger at small, uh, at small frequencies. So this is non-Fermi liquid. All right, but how do we apply it to metals? Because this is still an atom. Well, how was told us by uh, some people in this room. There's a paper by Song. Uh, I have to look it up. Chao Ming and Leon Balance, 2017. And then another paper, which I actually will follow, Chot Hari, Vernus, uh, Verman, um, Berg, and Sentil, and three of those who were here for our program where they said, well, we know how to deal with one SYK dot. Let's connect them into a lattice. So we'll have one dot, another dot. Cent centers of the dot form a regular lattice, let's say 2D. So I have these orbitals, lots of SYK orbitals in each of them. There is some hopping between the dots. Now the system knows about the R momentum because my fermions can hop from one dot to another, etc., etc. However, a rather simple analysis which I'll skip shows that the bandwidth, so if I look at the energy scale, let's say my finite temperature, now somewhere in the ideal world without the SYK interaction, there was a bandwidth given by the hopping energy, twice T40, etc., etc. et cetera. Et cetera. But the renormalized bandwidth in a strongly coupled limit, when the interaction is much larger than T, is much smaller than the original one. It's actually T squared O over U. So here we have still a heavy Fermi liquid. Once we go to low energies, we have some coherence in the sense that the block states propagate from one SVK dot to another SVK dot in a coherent manner. But above the scale, we are incoherent and to first degree, one can forget about the dispersion, which means that we go back to local physics. Right? And another gift from large N and from local physics is that if I would calculate the conductivity, let's say at final temperature, well, at the lowest order, that's just a our convolution of two of two our Green's functions, each of them is in the uh, high temperature limit, which is uh, a local limit, 
is given by this non-Fermi liquid form with the self-energy scaling as a root of the energy, of the energy scale. And normally, this is not enough. Normally, I have to worry about what is known vertex arc corrections. But because other Green's functions are purely local, this line dissects the diagram into two independent pieces, and the average of each of the pieces vanishes. So there are no vertex corrections. Well, then the, can, the arc conductivity just is, is equal to the integral uh, over the derivative of the Fermi function times the product of the imaginary part of two Green's functions square omega. Each of the Green's function scales as one over square root of energy. In this case, if I'm talking about IDC, this is uh, one over square root of temperature. I have two of those. I have sigma scaling as one over temperature, or the resistivity scaling as temperature. OK, so at least in the local limit, uh, this model uh, produces the ubiquitous uh, linear in temperature scaling, and it does so by going local by leaving us without any notion of the momentum, except for a matrix element, which, of course, comes here. So here is some expectation value of the velocity of the band, which is very narrow at this point. Okay? But other than that, it is totally a local physics. All right, so now, three. Yes, so that's, that's here. Temperature is much larger than t squared over u. Now, if I would be more or less careless and I would collect other prefactors, I would end up with the formula for the resistivity where temperature scales with the pre-normalized bandwidth. And I will single out the quantum of other resistivity in two dimensions up to a number. Okay? Now, I'm at temperatures, which is much larger than the effective bandwidth. And that means that my upper resistivity is much larger than upper quantum, so we have a bad metal by definition. Well, what if I go a bit further? There's a very popular game in our field. Our experimental colleagues uh, look at the measured upper resistivity, and then they say, well, suppose that we use a Druda formula of some kind, and we extract the effective scattering time from the Ruder formula. I can do it. I can introduce the mass, which, and as an any time bending model, is the hopping energy times A squared. That's one over mass, of course. And I can introduce the number density, which is near half filling, is one over A squared into D. So I have some notion of the mass, and I have some notion on M. So then, if I would morph, my upper resistivity into Drude like formula, I will end up with m star e squared n, some 1 over tau. And this 1 over tau will be temperature divided by the effective bandwidth, which means that it is much larger than temperature. Well, that brings us to the notion of a Planckian bound. Uh, it's not a rigorous notion, at least in most of other cases, but it comes from the intuitive um, expectation that by uncertainty principle, if I have, let's say, a Fermi energy and I have a particle with an excessive energy above this R Fermi, uh, um, the R Fermi energy, then the shortest time in which this particle can go back to the Fermi energy is one over this energy. As simple as that. Okay, so if my excessive energy is temperature, it means that uh, the scattering rate has to be always bounded by temperature. Maybe with some number. We don't know uh, the number. But in this case, we violate uh, the Planckian bound not by number, but by a parameter. Does it mean something? No. For morphing of my resistivity formula into a, a Drude uh, form was completely artificial. I don't have a direct way to measure this time other than to go back to do the formula, which doesn't make sense. However, there is another time hidden in this problem. And what I have to do now is to measure the conductivity at finite frequency rather than a zero frequency. 
And the model being local, nature has omega over t scaling. That is, if I would calculate other Green's function at finite frequency and finite temperature, the only combination which can enter into, into, this, in, in, into the Green's function is the ratio of omega over t. Same goes for the conductivity. The conductivity at finite frequency and finite temperature is a scaling form which I can write as uh, 1 over t, for example, with the prefactor, and then there would be some scaling function of omega over t. Okay, so as I said, one cannot really extract scattering time or any time from the prefactor of this function, but I can ask on which scale I will go from the DC limit with zero frequency to high frequency limit because this time is measurable. So I would look at the conductivity, of course, it's going to be the real part. In this case, I look at the conductivity. Conductivity in the DC limit scales is 1 over t. In the high frequency limit, because it's omega over t invariant system, it scales as 1 over omega. In between, it goes through some variation. And this variation happens at frequency of order temperature with a pure number. Now there is no physical parameter entering. And in this sense, I view this as a confirmation of uh, the uh, Planckian bound that this time is indeed saturated at the Planckian limit. It's not much larger than uh, temperature. OK? <laughs> well, OK, so I have more, but uh, thank you. Thank you for your attention. No, neither am I. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, um, there have been several attempts to measure this Planckian bound, but on cold atoms, I guess, for the... So do you know what... what Depends what we mean by measuring, right? Yes. Right, so if, it, if you look at the conductivity, or quote-unquote, and just morph it into something which we know and love through the formula, we may end up with uh, either satisfying Planckian bound or violating a Planckian bound, but I would argue that it doesn't make much sense. So one has to perform a dynamic measurement. One has to measure time as in time rather than a prefactor somewhere. Okay, so you mean you, you need to have access to the entire distribution? You need to have access to frequency scaling of your measured R quantity, and in cold atoms, there is a quantity which you can view as conductivity in some sense, right? But I don't think that they have omega O, which is killing. A comment and a question. The comments sure. are making a mistake. I think we club is a noun. Substantive is a verb. Your, who can I believe after that? Umklappen would be the verb. Okay. You want to, to bet my money on this? Yes. In, 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 uh, in transport, of course. Uh, I think so far we haven't seen a model in which it would be violated uh, in this sense, as an omega over t uh, scaling. If we come up with a counter argument, so, so, so far I think it, it is reasonable, right? Uh, but you know, models are models. I know what you're going to say. Yeah, we got a question. So you mentioned you studied this, some of the systems in quantum simulator. Uh, their connectivity is not such an unnatural question. So, you know, what observables would be uh, possible to tell between, let's say, viscosity? Liquid, viscosity? Uh, if, if, if it's. Uh, and again, more like quench type. Like, like Conda type of a system? Uh, conductance. But uh, is there any advantage in going beyond linear response in, in more directly being able to Oh, beyond, uh, be, yes. be, beyond linear response. Nothing comes to mind immediately. I would say um, a more interesting uh, direction is to explore other activities such as thermal conductivities, viscosities, the whole set 
thermal power of the whole set of Ansager R coefficients, uh, which may or may not be relevant or related to Galilean invariance. Conductivity is a very subtle thing uh, because it cares so much about the overlap between uh, the operators of momentum and other current. Other quantities are uh, less sensitive to this. as opposed to something athermal. Yes, so just non, a, of non-equilibrium. Well, um, as long as you maintain a well-defined boundary between occupied states and unoccupied states, the actual shape of the distribution doesn't really matter, right? But in order to speak of aquasi particles, you need to have a boundary, so we need to have a Fermi surface and it has to be defined one way or another. Some things which we know would not work in thermal, uh, in a thermal um, equilibrium. If we have steady state, then some theorems which we know and love, they're not going uh, to apply. But the, the, but, but the notion of a well-defined Fermi surface, at least as a starting point, is necessary. Yes, Yakov. Uh, that wasn't planned. Okay. Um, there is a 19th century mathematical theorem uh, for a product of Bessel functions, uh, which under interrogating all my friends in math, I couldn't uh, find a proof of. The theorem says that if you take uh, any number of Bessel functions, a product of them, This integral is equal to zero unless the coefficients, the frequencies, so to speak, form a polygon. Oh, any integer, any integer, any integer order. So namely, if I, okay, uh, a one, a two, a three, a four has to form a polygon, that is any of A's has to be smaller than the sum of the rest, because this is the shortest path between the two points. In this case, four, a five is rest. So it's been known for several special cases to uh, giants like Weber, Sonian, McDonald, etc., etc. But it turns out that if you consider being a aquasipatical person uh, and intervally umclop scattering between two Fermi surfaces, where you take two particles from one side and bring it to another side, and there is a threshold for this process, obviously, in order for have to an umclap, the radius of the Fermi surface has to be larger than something. The scattering probability of this process after several modifications can be mapped onto this form, and then we can work it backwards. Now, although the general integral doesn't have any analogy in aquasi-particle physics, having learned how to do it for two, we can do it for n, and we can prove the theorem. Is this value for every n? I'm sorry? Value for every n, big n. Yes, so you can pick one, yes, you can pick one, and because this is a side of a polygon. Yes. 